So let's talk about building out a small office network, a small home network. This is actually a build for a client, not exactly the same as it's going to be delivered to them, but conceptually the same, which is why I want to make a video about it. A lot of people have this question. Now we are starting out with a NetGate SG3100, a Unify 24 port switch, EOE, and a Unify Cloud Key, and a UAP HD. These are just the basics. There's actually more going into the client network, just a few more devices. But this is the basics to get started and to cover the important parts, which is planning the network. Now, the first part of the planning is someone may notice on the WAN that it's a 172 address. That's because it's in the lab. Uh, that's also why I can't put a standard block because someone likes to point this out uh, of blocking standard RFC 1918 addresses. Uh, if you block them, it breaks the WAN being that, et cetera, et cetera. So the next thing that's really important, this is where the planning stage begins. And a lot of people start and stop right here. They figure out a LAN address range they want to use. This particular range is 192.168.5.1. And they stop there because they just make a big flat network and all the devices live there. The problem is people love all kinds of random things like IoT devices that are well known for having security problems. And this is what allows easy lateral movement across the network. Unless you have a switch that is also doing some type of routing rules, it does not stay contained. So everything in the 5.1 network, if a device gets compromised, compromise can potentially increase your attack surface by laterally moving through the network with no rules. So what we did here is on this SG3100, and I use this one, but you can really use any firewall you want. I use PFSense because that's what the customer asked for, but this does work with other firewalls, of course. This is, you know, this is FYI here. You can build these VLANs out. Also, I may do the same video again with Untangle because uh, it's another firewall that we recommend. I no, someone's going to ask why we didn't use the Unify USG series because we're using Unify Switch and a Unify Access Point. And the reason why is because the more complex rules that need to be created, often uh, there's problems with them in the USG. It just it kind of falls flat on features. It's good for security. It works. It just doesn't have a lot of features to it. All right, moving on. So these are all VLANs we have created. Office, camera, phone, and guest. And they're already set up and already created. So we chose... Uh, 10 for the network that is going to be where the office computers live. Cameras are going to be on the 20 network. Phone is on the 30 network. Guest is on the 10.1.40. network. Now I'll give you a couple reasons for this. One, you want to start your LAN out to be something not standard, not 0 or 1. So it's 5.1 instead of 0 0.1 or 1.1 because those are really common. And if you want a VPN back into your office, a lot of times you're going to have a problem where, oh no, I'm on a zero network or a one network because I'm at you know a friend's house. Uh, you have routing problems if your network matches their network. If the VPN goes, well, do I route locally? Do I route there? There's ways around it, but FYI, make it different, solve problems. Next, 10, 20, and 30. I leave them all in the 192 range uh, to make it kind of easy to understand that, okay, they're all going to be common addresses. Then the guest range. We set that over on the 10. And I do that a lot of times when I build guest networks out for clients. That way, the guest network is on a completely different range. And you can quickly just, if you're looking through piles of IP addresses for stuff, you can go, okay, all the 10 stuff has to do with guest networks. And all the 192 stuff is equipment that they're using in the office. Like I said, this is just how I did it. It doesn't have to be done that way. There is one more thing that's common. 10, 20, 30, 40 across there relates to because these are all VLANs that we're going to be defining. Well, they're defined already, but we're going to show how we actually implement them. So 100, 200, 300, 400. Now they could have been 10, 20, 30, 40. It really doesn't matter. This just comes down to, I started at 100, 200, 300. So that's where they are now. Uh, and it's just a common schema. There's not a reason you have to do it that way. I could have made them one, two, three, four. I could have come up with complete arbitrary numbers, but Let's go ahead and create one more. So I was walking through the process of what had to be done. This has already been done for 100, 200, 300, 400. So the one thing you didn't see in this list, and a lot of people go, I want to put all my IoT crap on an IoT crap network. Good idea. Let's build it out. Let's build it out as 500. Now, parent inter interface means what's it going to be attached to. It's going to be attached to the LAN. And then if you're not familiar with the SG3100, watch my review on it, but there is a four port switch on the back of it. We're only going to be using one of the ports, but that essentially is the LAN. Some devices, it's just going to be one port for the LAN, and that's fine too. So 500, and this is called IoT Crap. 
And we'll just call it IoT crap. I don't need to put network. We get the idea. All right, so we've got the IoT crap. Now we're going to interfaces, assignments. And here's IoT crap ready to be assigned. Hit add. By default, it just uses because these were all called opt one, two, three, four, etc. So it's going to call it opt six. We click on it, enable IoT crap. And it's going to be static. Now we need an IP scheme for it. And we'll go ahead and put this one in the 10 range as well. That way you know that's the IoT crap. The, the ranges can't overlap if that's not obvious. Uh, each IP address has to be, each subnet with IP has to be unique. They can't overlap. You can split it so we can have the 50 and then split them, but that's a longer and more detailed discussion. For the most part, for simplicity, slash 24 on each one. Save, apply. So now we've added one more. All right, now the next thing you have to do, services, HTTP server. And we have to go over to IoT crap. These are created on the fly. I've already enabled all these. Like I said, this is the process I went through to build all these other ones. So enable it. We have to give it a range. So we'll start at 10, uh, 10. Go to, uh, I don't know, 250. That way, if you wanted to statically assign a couple, you have a couple room at the end. When you're deciding ranges, sometimes you may want to start them here because you want to start statically assigning. And the way PF Sense works, when you do static assignments, you want to make sure you have enough range because you can't assign statically devices, IP addresses that are within the range. But we'll leave this one to 10. We'll assume all the IoT stuff can just be wherever. It's usually not the most relative relevant information is where it's at. Uh, usually it calls out to the internet for its functionality anyways. Now we will come back over here to the LAN network. And I do have, speaking of reservations, one of the things I like to do is create reservations for things. And they're right here at the bottom of the LAN. So right here is 5.5. .5. That's our Unified Cloud Key Gen 2 Plus. And what you do is you go here, we're gonna, you can go in, Creating static mappings is easy. Just click the little add static mapping, type in an IP address on there. My laptop was plugged in is why you're seeing that. It's not plugged in at the moment, but that's one of the other leases that were in there. So I love assigning everything via the DHCP in PFSense for static mapping. The reason for that is that way everything is where it should be all the time in a very predictable place. I really do find that important. And one of the reasons of assigning it here versus just statically assigning each device, you can actually do both. And I've done this as well. And the reason for that is if you sign each device statically and then you have to, I don't know, factory reset that device because of whatever reason. For example, like my laptop has a static assignment uh, at home. Whenever I reset or reload it, no big deal. I know it's going to get the same IP address. If I want to statically assign it, I can. But I know that IP address is always reserved based on the MAC address. So uh, having that does help map your network. It's also great if you have everything set to DHCP. If you decide to move your network range, you just go and edit all the mappings here instead of logging into every device, restart all the devices, or tell them to get new IP addresses. They all are on that new range. So I highly recommend uh, doing this and having all your leases set up. So that's all we had to do on a PFSense side to create that new network with one more exception, which was the rules. And we're going to cover all the rules now. So we'll start with WAN. Because I'm in my office right now, not in where the studio, where all this is set up. So I have a couple uh, NAT rules to allow external access uh, to devices in there, including the Unify and including to get to the firewall itself. Here's the basic LAN network. We're going to leave this one wide open for now. And what this allows us to do is go through and say, okay, the LAN can get to where it needs to get to. And the LAN is where we're going to have all of our devices living. We've already made the switches on there, the access points on there, the cloud key all lives on this LAN, which is the five network. The office computers are all going to live here. Now we're going to make the assumption that we want the office computers to do whatever. They want to be able to get to the internet um, and do things. But then, of course, they're all segmented out. So if you wanted to create rules around them, you could. And we're not blocking access to manage the firewall from the office network, because we're assuming it's probably where your computer will live. Now, camera network. This is where we're going to get a little bit 
specific with the firewall rules. If you didn't notice up here, the firewall has been moved to 104.4.3. I always move the firewall from whatever the default port is, which is 4.4.3 in PFSense. Um, and it's just one of those, it's not as much security through obscurity, as, but having it on 4.4.3 can create other problems if you have to map through and NAT to your internal devices that also may be running on an HDS port like that as well. And it's just nice to have it on a different port. But what this does is if you're on the camera network, this means block the firewall. So destination, the firewall block 104.4.3. And this rule persists across all these different networks. Then we say only allow a single destination because the cameras, this is particular setup because we're using a cloud key gen two plus with unify protect and unify protect is on 5.5, .5, the same IP address as the cloud key itself. There's probably some way to split it. I didn't really look into that. And this is going to vary with your design of your network. If you have an NVR, you could just put the NVR in there and, for example, only allow the NVR external access. But for sake of this, we don't want the different cameras on the camera network going anywhere except for their one destination, which is going to be this. Now, a couple of notes about that, just a quick note. If you add cameras to the Unify Protect, you can add them on the five network is how we did this and then move them. And we're going to cover that in, when we get to the physical part, move them over to the camera network and they realize what they were adopted to. So they keep trying to contact, even if they move on a different network, they will go back and route over here. So you can trust that the cameras can't get out to the internet. They can only go one place and just for ease of use. So when you have to manually adopt them, I did have them on the LAN network and we moved them. And like I said, we're going to cover that when we get to the physical layer. Phone network. This is making the assumption that there's not an internal PBX, but let's say they're using whatever provider they're using for external access, uh, say, you know, hosted PBX external to their office is there. So the phones do need to get to the internet. We don't want the phones to go back to the LAN or the office, because what if this you know, cloud provider using pushes some weird firmware. I know it's a real edge case attack here. I'm tinfoil hat in this. But if the phones became compromised in some way, uh, where would they be able to go? Well, they got to get to the internet to work. Uh, they can't talk to the firewall. So if they were able to get into the phone, they can't talk to the firewall itself to try to admin it. And they can't talk to the LAN or the office where the other devices were there. Of course, you could also add blocks for guest and IoT crap if you wanted to. This is the guest network. And we... Once again, block the firewall. We block the private networks. That way the source is someone from the guest network, but the destination cannot be, which is what this alias means, cannot be, because it's got the exclamation point from it, the LAN office camera or phone. And this is the alias list. Once again, like I said, this is the list on there if you need to add another network. And someone will point out you could just block all RFC, et cetera, et cetera, but you run into the problem of it's in a lab and it doesn't work like that. Now, let's... I mean, you see the rule itself too. Single access, invert match. And this is the important part is that the invert's connected there. Back to the rules. Now, when we created IoT Crap Network, a lot of people have asked me this question about PF Sense and security. And they say, well, you know, what's the default way to set this up? What's the best practice to set this up? You know, is it secure? And from the PF Sense people, and I like that they've said this, they go, if it's the best practice, we make it the default. So the default when you create a new network is not to do anything. The network is completely dead. It's blocked. There's no rules that allow any traffic to pass. And I've seen a lot of people, they create a network, they add the DHCP server, and they go, nothing gets an address. Nothing's working. What's going on? Well, you don't have a rule. Now, what we need is, and where you can copy this rule, we'll just recreate it. We're going to add a rule here, change this to any interface source, the IoT crap net, invert match destination single host or alias, private networks, allow. Block private. So we have that same rule here again, apply changes. And the firewall rule too, this is the copy rule option. So we're just going to copy it. Make it easy. We just have to change which interface it's on, IoT crap. And IoT crap net. Save apply. Now it has the same rules. 
you know, like I said, you can create these manually. You can click copy for uh, making it a little bit easier. But we have the same idea. We block access to the firewall admin. Now, it's up to you. Obviously, IoT Crap will have access to the guest, and guest has access to IoT Crap. If you wanted to create another rule to block those two, you could. Just throwing it out there if you wanted to do that. I don't worry about it as much because this is kind of where the junk on the network lives. All right, now let's go over to Unify. So by default, when you adopt a Unify switch, when you get it set up, the default profile is all. And we'll explain what that means here. So we go here to profile. And I did this right here in case you're wondering, you just check the little box that says profile to show it on the tab. If not, it looks like this. I think it should be there by default, but it's obviously really easy to do. So you want to see what the profile is for each port. Now, the profile all means send everything. Send the LAN and all the VLANs, whatever they might be, down the pipe. So coming from the firewall, we definitely need it. The firewall's got the 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 VLANs to find or any ones we decide in the future. So we need all those to come through into the switches on Unify here. And some devices are definitely going to need those too. If we want the uh, access points, for example, they also need for each one you plug in to be set to the all because you want to parse the VLANs inside the access point, not to find the VLAN and then push it to the access point. There's ways you can do it. There's maybe more advanced setups where there are circumstances, but for the sake of this talk right here, this is the ideal way you want to set this up. You could only send the VLANs that are only going to be used on it for further restrictions. Like I said, you can really get fine grain if that's what you wanted to do. But uh, for sake of this talk, we're going to assume you want to send all, and that's going to create the least amount of headaches for you. Now, there's only one switch involved in this. If you have another switch, the ports that the switch is attached to, like another managed switch or another Unify switch, you want all, that means send all the VLANs over to the next switch. That way you can parse the VLANs on the next switch as well. So that's the reason we have all. Now, another option besides all is, of course, just sending the LAN, which means send the native LAN network, the five network, but don't send all those other VLANs that are right here. So like I said, that's another option, but not the ideal one for how we're setting this up. Now, what we are going to do is go through here and reassign all these. So we'll check the boxes. And there's a couple different ways you can do it. Actually, I like this feature. So you can just check them by ports. And these are all the extra ports we're going to plug our office computers into. So we might want to edit all of them so you can group them. But before I do that, let's create a custom profile. So we go over here, profiles, switch ports. These are all just created on the fly as I created the networks. You're going to see these here. So there's nothing you can really do to edit them. You view them. And this is where we're going to get a little bit fancier here. So this is going to be the office profile. Now, native network is not LAN. The office, we want VLAN 100. And before you ask why you don't just assign VLAN 100 to those ports, that's because we want to create a phone network on there because we're going to use the pass-through feature. Oh, not camera. Phone. There we go. So by default, enabled inside of Unify is LLDP-MED. And what this is, is part of the demo when we get to the physical layer. This is going to allow the ports to hand out natively when a computer plugs into them. They're going to hand out that office network, that 192.168.10 network. But if we add a phone, the phones will actually get a 30 address and be applied to the rules on that network. The phones Pretty much all of them that I'm on common phones, I should say, or can someone point out some exception, I'm sure. But most of your common phones, and we're, in this case, we're going to use a Cisco one, but your Sangomas, your Cisco's, Yealink, et cetera, they all have this built into the phone and they have a pass through option in there. And what the pass through options can allow it to do is pass through because it works as a switch, the office network, the dot 10 network, but the phone goes on a different network, whatever voice network we assign, which is 300. So what we do is the native to that port is give it a 10 address, but if you're a phone, you get a 30 address, but that 30 address, then you can pass back down and still get a 10 address on there. It's actually a really great feature to have on here. And we build it as a profile called the office. And now you'll see why we build it as a profile, because now we would go back over here to our device. 
And we're going to edit it. Edit the ports, let's pop this out, make it a little bit easier. And we're gonna leave five and six different, but we'll set the rest of them to be the office. Clicky, clicky, get all these on there. Now, it, sometimes people make the mistake of clicking one, thinking it edits all of them. You gotta go down to the bottom, edit selected ports, and we're gonna change them to our custom profile, the office, and apply. Now here's the funky stuff we're gonna do with these ones here. So those are all called the office now. Let's unselect those so we can edit these ports. You can see this is all profile of the office. We're gonna make port five, a guest network. This is where we allow our friend to plug his computer in. And he plugs into this port, and this port puts them on the guest network. So it's pretty easy to do. And it's nice uh, that you can easily do these and switch these profiles around and move them around later. Uh, guest or friend. And obviously, if you're connecting them to a Wi Fi, that's easy enough. But sometimes they go, you know, I want to plug something in. And once you do that, you know, it, you got to make sure they're plugged into the right port and it assigns the right things. That's why it's, it's important to have all these. I've seen people say they disable all the ports except for implicitly plugged in ones. From a security standpoint, it is great because this is frequently when there's a physical layer attack on your network. One of the ways things happen is people will go in and plug things in. And if the ports are live and assigned, well, they're on whatever network that port is assigned to. So disabling until used, not a bad way to start throwing it out there. So that's the guess for a friend. And we'll make this one IOT thing. And I, one of the reasons I think this is important is your IOT crap. How does that work? Well, the IOT crap sometimes needs to be PoE. So you need to plug it in, but you go, man, I don't want it wandering around my network because it's IOT crap. So being an IOT thing, IOT crap, and apply. And this will allow port six, to be IoT. Now, one of the other things you notice is we have the camera network, but the camera is not on the camera network. It's on the other network. Well, let's go ahead here and we're going to change the camera network to be camera. And now we hit apply. Now, the only thing different we have to do, and like I said, this is a note of the cloud key and how the Unify Protect works. With Unify Protect, we told it while it was on the five network to get adopted to where the Unify Protect lives is at the 5.5 address. The nice thing is once you move it, it's there. So by changing this switch profile, it moved. Now all he's gotta do is reboot the camera. So we hit restart, switch port power cycle this. Yep, because it's PoE powered camera. When we do this, it's going to restart the camera and the camera's gonna get a 30 address and be working. So that's pretty easy for how you do the switch ports. Now let's talk about how you do the Wi-Fi. Now, please note, I did say that it has to be pushed to all. That's an important aspect here. So go to wireless networks and you can see how each of these works. Camera demo, WPSK, we got a password on it, 200. This way, if we had a camera and we wanted to put it on there, well, you can put the camera on it, no problem. Same thing could go with phones if you wanted to create one for phones. Um, your guest network, well, a guest network is a 400 VLAN and the office network is a 100 VLAN. So please note, this will be handing out and the DHCP and everything will be working over these VLANs and handing them out, but nothing will be in the five range because like I said, that's our protected LAN. Even though this device lives in there, this is why sending all to the Unify HD works because then it handles all the slicing up based on SSID. And we can create one more network called IoT crap stuff. Make a password for it. Advanced options. And we know that is going to be VLAN 500. And away you go. Now, on the guest network, I have further added that the guest policies are on here. Apply guest policies. And what those do is create further restrictions. So there's isolation. So things connecting to it can't talk laterally to other things on there. That may break a lot of IoT devices if they try. If you try to make any communication with them because it sets them in isolation mode. For guests, that's generally fine, throwing it out there. 
Now, before we move over to the physical layer, being this is a small office setup, this question may come up of why I didn't create a separate network for printers. And that's because that's a giant headache. Uh, some printers just don't work well when you put them on separate networks. They kind of expect to be on the same network as the office. Your results may vary, um, no guarantees. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. It varies a model and I don't have time to go into every printer model on there. Um, you can decide whether or not you want your printer to be IoT crap or if you want it to be there. And by the way, when these rules were created, just a, one more reiteration of this, the office network, because the firewall rules for the office network, say I can go wherever I want, I can hit things on guest. It's a one-way street though. It's just like going out to the internet. They can start here in office, and if you know the IP address of something on IoT crap, you can get to that IP address. You can route over to it, you can route over to phone, but you can't initiate a connection from IoT crap because of this block back over to LAN or the office network. So that's it's a one-way street. You have to initiate the connection from these networks to this network, but they don't get to initiate connections the other way around. But that is what causes printers to have a problem because a lot of the printers do look for local devices as part of the discovery method, especially those all-in-one scanning devices. I've seen a lot of them. They just don't like crossing subnets in general. So your results may vary if you want to put your printers on a separate network. Just be prepared to troubleshoot that. I also didn't mention in any of this egress filtering. Like I said, by default, there's no egress, which means filtering what outbound ports can be used. It's up to you if you want to go that much further into it. it goes out of scope of this talk. All right, now let's take a look at the physical layer and talk about how this looks in action. So now we are at the physical layer. We have the NetGate SG3100 sitting here, the Unify switch, the cloud key, which by the way is kind of cool the way it is just powered over PoE. I mean, it does have an option of power via USB-C, but you know, it's nice that we've got a PoE switch and a PoE cloud key uh, working on here. Now this is the Gen 2 Plus that is managing this particular camera. If I do a motion event, hey, there we go. It gets a cool spinny. I love that. Uh, so we know it's recording a motion event that it just occurred and there's a little readout on here on the cloud key. So the next step is you notice that coming in, this is WAN, this just goes back to the switch over there, provides the IP address from our network to this network. And then the orange cable goes into, like we talked about port one on the Unify switch that allows the everything to traverse and that's orange is bringing all the VLANs and everything because that's an all port. Now, just a side note, if you were to use the four port switch on the back of this, there's probably, I think there's a way you can divide out the VLANs on it, but by default, anything plugged into this four port switch is going to just get the uh, standard 5.1 address. We really wanna put everything into this switch here uh, as much as possible. That way we can control and uh, delegate access. So my computer's plugged in over here on port 24. And let's show you what IP address that I have. So here's the IP address of my computer because I'm plugged in that port. It's 192.168.10.10, first range in that office network. Now, what if we move my computer to another port? So let's just show something real quick here. We look at the Unify here. We'll just, I like popping this out so it looks better. So we have the IOT crap is six and we have guest for friend uh, over here. So what happens is I should be able to get a different IP address when I plug in those ports. So any of these ports will just give me a standard IP address, and this one right here should give me the proper I, uh, one here. So let's uh, test that theory real quick and show you how that works. So port six, IoT crap. Okay, connection established. And we went from having a .10 address to a .10.50 address. Pretty simple. Test the other part here. This is the one that we called guest for a friend. And now it's a 40.10 address. So you get the idea that that's how you assign that. And when we look again at those assignments, they're set guest. Now let's show how the office. Now you notice at the office, I get 192.168.10.10 plugging my laptop into the port. What if we plugged in a phone to it? So 
So we have a standard, well, old Cisco phone, SPA508G, and it's got the port, and it's lighting up right now and booting. And it's got the port, and it's got the pass-through port. Now, this is common in a lot of office scenarios because in the offices, we see where they don't want to run two lines to every workstation or they have existing infrastructure. There's only a single line, but they want to go VoIP. And this is back to why this is set up this way and why that the LLDP works really well in this scenario so we can just pass it through. We pass it on over. This needs PoE, so the PoE switch will power it. And like I said, a very common office setup. And then we're gonna take my computer, pull the network cable out of this, plug it into here. And this is blinking at me because it doesn't have a PBX to talk to. Um, so it's not happy, but it works. Uh, and it has an address and we'll look at that in the PF sense here. So now let's look at my computer, which has an address again. So the last one was 40. So even though it's plugged in through the phone, I still have that 10 dot address. What about the phone? What address did it get? So we go over here, firewall, whoop, DCP server. And there's our phone with the 30.10. I just, I know this is the actual host name of the phone, but that's how the phone, even though it's plugged into that segment of the network called the office, this is where that custom profile works and it passes along the 30 address to the phone. And then the phone's basically going, okay, but I'm a switch and the devices behind here don't get that address. So my computer has no knowledge of VLANs. A lot of your devices do not. It goes, no problem. I'm just going to get whatever address this gives me and I'm back on that network. And this sometimes creates confusion if you've not seen this before, because a lot of times you go, why are the phones in a different IP range, but it's only one physical cable? Hopefully that sorts that out. Now, one other note about like the camera right here. So this is the Unify Protect camera. And I don't know that a lot of people have thought about this. And this is a really interesting uh, physical layer attack on a lot of networks. Well, these are waterproof cameras, which means they go outside and someone wants to get inside your network. What could happen? What could potentially go wrong? And uh, this, is, this is a problem where that can be solved with some of these firewalls. And I, I just bring this up because I think it's kind of a novel thing, but I've I've talked to companies about this and once did in a demo uh, use this for a company to as to get into their network. But if you go on the outside of the building and you plug into the camera, this is just a reminder of why some of those cameras should be make sure they're on a specific port. It's not always the camera you're worried about, but if someone were to take down your camera and plug something else in, uh, they would have access to your network. Well, in the case of this, Look at the firewall rules again. That's why the camera only has access to this 5.5 address. And by the way, the camera now has that 192.168.20. So let's go over here, look at the profile for it. And you see we have the camera, go back here, customize columns, profile, so we see it easier. It is set to camera and being on that camera 200 gives it that IP address there. But if we go back over here and we want to do a live feed from it, you can see the live feeds working. So that's what, that's actually what I look at behind the camera in case you're wondering there. So the, the live feed is working. It's routing through the firewall and over to this device here. So kind of novel, uh, that the cameras, once you adopt them, I, this is a, feature of the protect. But for example, if you're using a bunch of cameras, you put the NVR and everything on that same network and you wouldn't have to worry about this extra routing rule that we have. But this routing rule is what keeps us protected from that edge case where someone goes outside my building, unplugs my camera and plugs in, well, I don't know, a Raspberry Pi, which of course you could have powered over the PoE. So you're actually providing uh, whoever is attacking your network, the power and back end their way into your network, which is why you, you know, it's not just the camera you have to worry about. It's a little bit more thought that may go in there. So a camera down could be just a camera down or a camera down could be the discovery of a device plugged in. Anyways, back to this network. Um, that's pretty much all you need to do to get all this working. So this is the network in a nutshell, this is common for a lot of small businesses, a lot of offices we set up, we're gonna see you know, a phone going to, what that we want them on a separate network. And sometimes you do that too, just because of how many IP addresses you have available and segmenting everything out. This also allows you to do things, for example, when you have all the phones on a separate 
uh, VLAN and a separate network, you can apply traffic shaping or priority to that particular segment of the network. That's another good reason to break the phones out. Having all the cameras, once again, on a separate network. So you can create rules in case someone attacks from the camera side or if there's some type of flaw found in a camera and they become an attack vector from whatever reason. But having all these segmented out is what makes this much better of a network. And this is frequently when we've covered this on different you know, security videos that I've done is we talk about lateral movement through networks. This helps segment out the lateral movement and gives you the ability to start applying rules to things because sometimes we hear the term wormable all the time and that's a lot of times we're talking about it just worms its way through your network. Well, if there's firewall rules, we're literally blocking that access, having this separated out helps a lot. So uh, that was it for this video. We'll leave questions, comments, concerns below or jump over to our forums uh, where I'm very active, where I'll be talking about this as well if you have other questions about different scenarios and setups. Uh, but overall, this is, in a nutshell, this is like a basic office setup that we do all the time for small businesses. You know, even if you're a home-based business, this is not a bad setup to use, uh, and which is actually what this is destined for, someone who's a home user where there's a couple people uh, that run a design company uh, out of their house, essentially. You know, it's gonna give them the access they need. They're gonna add a few more things. They're gonna add VPN to this and a few other features. Uh, but for the basics of getting the network started and having everything nice and organized, it's great. Um, and I think one of the networks I have to add for them is the kids network, because they just want the kids stuff on there, uh, which can also be handy, because then you could just block access whenever you wanted to to the whole kids network and tell them to go to bed. Another option that you can do on there. All right, thanks. Uh, once again, head over to our forums to further the discussion on this and you know talk about it more in depth if you got questions and concerns or if you want to tell me I got something wrong because there's always a chance of that. Uh, I will make annotations for corrections if there's something I missed, but I think I got everything. May not have spelled everything right. I didn't check that yet, but someone will point that out if I did. Thanks. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you want to subscribe to this channel to see more content, hit that subscribe button and the bell icon, and maybe YouTube will send you a notice when we post. If you want to hire us for a project that you've seen or discussed in this video, head over to lawrencesystems.com where we offer both uh, business IT services and consulting services and are excited to help you with whatever project you want to throw at us. Also, if you want to carry on the discussion further, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can keep the conversation going. And if you want to help the channel out in other ways, we offer affiliate links below, which offer discounts for you and a small cut for us that does help fund this channel. And once again, thanks again for watching this video and see you on next time.